Joan, I really do wish that you had made this simpler for me. You know, it's, uh, this, this is an extremely complicated topic, talking about health system reform and what we have to do to be ready for it. And how many of you here have heard me go through this presentation or presentations before? A few of you have? Okay. Glad very few. That means I can tell all the old jokes, so it's a, that helps. But it's um, what, what Rebecca has asked me to do is to talk a little bit about sort of how we're approaching health system reform in Virginia and then want to talk to you a little bit about the technology framework that we're trying to implement in Virginia that hopefully will help you do your work on a go-forward basis. And um, Jenny, I am hoping that I'll have the opportunity to introduce you to the proper names of the rest of the Commonwealth. You know, the, the, okay? I'm from up in Northern Virginia too, but you can learn it. It's like Southwest and Southside and Hampton Roads and, you know, Central Virginia. There are names that work and, and we could probably even teach you, but that's, uh, that's, that just, we'll get there. But, okay, the PPACA, what does it mean? President Obama signs the bill in March of last year. And understand this wasn't your typical bill. This was a bill that was done through sort of what's called a reconciliation process. And then after that, another bill was signed, which was a package of amendments to it. So the complexity stems from the fact that it really never got to the end through a fully vetted process. And, and as I think you all probably have experienced before, a lot of things are complicated when done normally. And I think this actually probably is complicated a little bit more. There are, there are clearly our room, there is a lot of room to make this bill, I think, a little simpler, perhaps a little more easy to implement, but I'm not holding my breath that anything significant will change for the better in the near future. So just, just know that uh, we're aware of that and we sort of feel your pain. But basically, you know, so you're secretary and you were an orthopedic surgeon and two months later, you're, two and a half months later, you are now a secretary and the PPACA is signed. And what it basically says is that everybody up to 138% of the federal poverty level calculated some way that Joan and others at Georgetown can figure out that I can't. But anyway, those people go on Medicaid. Now in Virginia, we've been looking at a range from about 275,000 was our initial take. We have seen numbers up to 435,000 individuals will come into Medicaid. 1114 eligibility, and that is in the uninsured adults primarily. As you mentioned, we're low there because we just plain don't cover them under Medicaid. So that's, that's where a lot of that population will be. Between this 138% and 400% of the poverty level, individuals who are not insured through work, more or less, will be eligible for a federal subsidy so that they can buy health insurance in something called a health benefit exchange. Got it? Now, does anybody know what a health benefit exchange is? You do? Would you come on up here? I want you to be on the panel, okay? I'm gonna need your help, because we are still trying to figure it out. But, but so, you know, you're secretary and you get this good news, and, and you've got all the insurance reforms and things like that, and you know, what, what is the first thought? It's, oh my God, you know, who's gonna take care of all these people? Uh, how are we going to get them enrolled? And uh, does that interest you all at all? Yeah, and then how are we gonna pay for it? And, and those, are, those are the big issues. So, and, and it doesn't just affect Medicaid. The, the health benefit exchanges out there, the mandates in the private sector, and there are a whole number of things to consider. And we, you all probably did hear the rumor, even up in Northern Virginia, I assume, that Virginia or Richmond's not too happy with the rules altogether, the PPACA, you've heard about that? Yeah, I thought so, mm -hmm. I thought so. Let me, let me kind of say what, what the Attorney General has said, and this is important because people say to me, says, Dr. Hazel, well, if you all, you know, why are you suing if all this is so good, why are you questioning the mandate? And it's, it's really a good question. And I think the issue here is it may be something about our Virginia heritage. That, that we were arguing about the separation of state and federal rights before there was even a country. I mean, the, the, the Bill of Rights was written here and so forth. So there are people who have a legitimate concern that, that the mandates themselves are an overreach of federal authority. And it's that simple. 
And even though it makes good health policy, if you're going to have mandatory issue, that, you are, that you're going to have to have everybody participate. And I believe the Urban Institute that's done some good work with this is that if we don't, if the mandate goes away and the guaranteed issue for the private sector does not go away, prices or premiums will go up about 15 percent. And so that's the balance. And in fact, I shared that information with the Attorney General last night. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so we, uh, it, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. But the bottom line here is, is that there is a constitutional issue, Constitution Trump's health policy, and frankly, the Supreme Court will hopefully tell us sooner rather than later, now, not for any political reasons, other than we got to build this system, and knowing what we have to do would be particularly helpful. So that, that's sort of what the argument has been about. Now, that being said, you go to the governor, you say, Governor, what are we going to do? This is the law, and you need to get us ready. To, to meet the conditions of the law. So we, Governor, asked me to form the Virginia Health Reform Initiative. We have 24 people, and we met a lot last year, and we had six task forces. They were on Medicaid reform, insurance reform, delivery and payment reform, capacity, technology, and then we called one the Purchasers Work Group. And these met through last December, and there was a report put out with about 28 recommendations, and a lot of them have already essentially been implemented. And I want to take you through them first, uh, just to let you know where we are. Medicaid, why would we have a Medicaid work group? Medicaid has been the fast growing part of the state budget for the last 20 years. And the, the concern is it's like the monster that ate Tokyo. I mean, there are people who want to do things other than educate, uh, other than Medicaid, and so there are, there are issues in a lot of people's minds with the cost. So that we, that we think that there are ways to organize care better, utilize resources more efficiently, reduce fraud and abuse, things like that. And I'll tell you, I personally don't think there's enough fraud and abuse out there to solve the whole Medicaid problem. There are people who believe it. Well, trust me, believe it. They believe it. But, but these are all little pieces of the puzzle that we have to work on and put together, and we're making, we're making strides in addressing all of that. You all will hear us talk a lot about coordination of care and managed care. The idea there is to create some sort of structure around care that people get the right care in the right place at the right time. I don't like the old term managed care very much. I, I'm a recovering orthopedic surgeon. All it meant for me was a lot of hassle. And, and a lot more staff I had to hire, and we got paid less. And that didn't really impact the quality of care much at all for the better. But we think that the newer systems of care, patient-centered medical homes, alignment of benefits, model payments, or different model payment systems will help deliver better value for the care we provide through Medicaid. So that's really where we're trying to, to take that. The other thing the Medicaid committee said is you're going to have to figure out this enrollment issue. And we believe that there are technologies that are now available that will help do that. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more later, so let's just put that aside and I'll come back to it. Now, the next group has to do with insurance reforms, and this is to kind of put Medicaid in perspective. The PPACA said we're going to, allow, we're going to require plans to offer coverage for dependents up to age 26. Now, who thinks that's a good idea? I mean, yeah, I do. Everybody does, um, almost everybody. Another thing that they said is that uh, we're not going to allow you to deny coverage for kids up to 18. You know, they got to get into the insurance market someplace. Now, who thinks that's a good idea? You know, besides me. I mean, we, we do. And then this no rescission. Somebody gets sick and then are told they don't have insurance. That's not going to be accepted anymore. <coughs> and, and I think we all think that's a good idea. Now, <coughs> the interesting part is, is that the, the private payers say that that would add about 3% to the basic insurance premium which is the, the iron, you know, you're, the problem is people can't afford it. And we're making it more expensive by some of the things that we do to make it, make it uh, uh, more available. So those are real difficult things to tread. So if any of you all have answers to that and want to be secretary, you come up and sit next to her on the panel and we'll talk. But, but those, so we're, we're working at that. But what we did agree is that Virginia's Bureau of Insurance should enforce the rules that the insurance companies live under. Just a practical matter, 
to have to be regulated by two regulators is hard, it's expensive, and we tried to make that uh, simpler. Uh, and one effort, one effort for the government to make it simple, and we tried it, it's working. They also ask us to look at the health benefit exchange. And under the provision, if a health benefit is ex exchange is required, how will Virginia do it? And this summer, we spent three public meetings and we spent a lot of time and effort. The Urban Institute helped us, PricewaterhouseCoopers helped us, uh, George Mason helped us you know, to, sort of to offer a design. And we have made some recommendations to the governor the, about how to, re how to advise the General Assembly when it comes time to build a health benefit exchange. But the piece that you all need to know about most is that I envision, and I think we envision, that all the eligibility testing will be done through the current system. Y'all don't act like that's good news. <laughs> Come on. Martin, you said they were going to be ready. Huh? I was teed up to make you well, understand the problem. You do 1.2 million Medicaid applications a year. That's up you know, a couple hundred thousand from three years ago. You do 1.2 million SNAP applications a year. You got TANF, you got LIHEAP, you got the other programs. And have any of you all had any increase in staff recently to help you? No. And have you read the JLARC report? All right. Now, why this is important is that JLARC report, when it was originally sent out to us as a draft, said there was $681 million in fraud due to errors in eligibility. Who believes that? Well, we told them, we said, no, we don't think so. We don't think that's the case at all. The fact that something might have been missing on an application did not reflect the fact that these people should not have been on or did not say that these people shouldn't have gotten the benefit. Basically, it says is that we're overworked and under-resourced and we're just we're cutting corners maybe occasionally just a little bit in order to try to get the benefits out the door, particularly around the um, renewals because we know that that's not really the major priority because you know that's coming anyway and when you got people who are hungry you're more worried about SNAP than you are about Medicaid. At least that's what we've learned. I believe that's accurate. Is that accurate, Commissioner? Yes, sir. See how he says yes, sir? That's great. <laughs> yeah, that, thank you for that. But anyway, that's, that's, where, that's where we are. So we've told JLARC and the final report comes out and they says, well, it's between 25 and so many million and they, they listened and were kind of nice to us about that, but we've got to fix that. We really do. There's, there's a, a lot of data out there that shows that in Medicare there's fraud when they look into it, and there probably is some. It may be more on the provider side, but getting to that error rate is something we're going to need to ask you to really focus on. So just be prepared for that. Now, the next area that we need to go, and by the way, we think that the Urban Institute tells us that the number of people that will be coming in to have eligibility determination is probably four to 500,000 more people than what we're currently getting. And what we would envision is that they would apply for the benefit, we would process it through the system we use for DMAS, then we would create some sort of certificate that would then go to, quote, the exchange. And that's what they would use to determine the eligibility for benefits and so forth. So the reason we think we need to do it that way is, is number one, who knows whether they're Medicaid or up or down or what the rules are, where would they go if they don't know? So to have it done in one place makes it a lot easier. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. And, then, and the, then the second is we then are able to move people into the proper plans, I think, a little bit more easily. So, and the third reason is that we can actually start work on that. We have started work on it, and the commissioner's going to tell you a little bit about that going forward. But that, that's what is in the works. Now, the, what you'll we'll need to think about a little bit, because we're thinking about it, is that a good use of your time in the local social service departments? Do you all want to be in that business going forward? Are there more effective and efficient ways? Should you all maybe only be dealing with the with the high-end population that has multiple benefits they're getting and needs coordination of benefits or maybe the nursing homes or something different and just let it automate as much as possible the other. And so that's a conversation I think we're going to need to have going forward. So just be, be prepared for it. It's not out of malice. It's out of the fact that we're going to end up trying to put 10 pounds of stuff in a five-pound bag and, and we don't have another bag. So just, just be prepared for that. Now, said so there were six, six committees I've hit insurance. Are you all tired of it already? Because we go to delivery reform, and I think at the heart of the problem, and, and 
one of the issues that we're most concerned about is the PPACA brings a lot more uh, people into coverage, but coverage, but the value of care in the United States does not seem to match that in other countries. We think that we pay more for care and we get probably less value for care in the United States than any place in the world. And, and that is a real problem when businesses are buying insurance for employees and, you know, and we're not getting the value and the workforce is not healthy. So we're looking at are there things we can do that change how we pay uh, to promote some innovations in delivery to make us offer higher value care. And we are setting up an innovation center over at the Chamber of Commerce that hopefully will be up and running in January. We've raised some money. We'll be looking at the innovation center funds from the feds to try to deal with that. So, and this helps us in another way because does anyone here think we have enough people out there to take care of this additional population, particularly in Medicaid? I mean, my, my, my question was is, all right, so they get coverage, is there any care with that? They aren't expecting coverage on January 14th or January of 2014, they're expecting care. And we do not have enough doctors and we do not have enough nurses, so we need to look at redesigning the care team. So we've asked the doctors and the nurses to get together and come up with some recommendations around, around enabling team care, allowing nurses to do more uh, in order to, to build some of this capacity that we need. And we will, I think, see some legislation this year that will allow that to, to happen. Now the fifth area is technology. And technology has a lot of parts to it. You've all heard about electronic medical records and all that. And we are building a health information exchange in Virginia. We just signed the contracts last week and that will begin to work and that will hopefully help with that a little bit. We're looking at how better to use telehealth and telemedicine to expand capacity, particularly in, in psychiatry, believe it or not, in, in adolescent psychiatry. We have a lot of kids that just don't get the mental health care. Have you all noticed that too? Yeah, yeah. Now the, the neat experience, I think it's in Martinsville, the CSB hired an adolescent psychiatrist from, you finished up at UVA. They're living in Charlottesville, but they're going to practice a, you know, full time by telemedicine to Martinsville. So these are some ways that we think that we can innovate and, and, bring, and help expand capacity, and we're trying to encourage that. Now, and then the final area I just mentioned is we've had this purchasers group, and Cindy Jones, uh, you all know, said, uh, said, I never quite understood why you wanted to do that, but the fact is, is that if we're going to reform the delivery system, we need the business community who selects insurance for everybody that the government's not selecting it for, um, for all practical purposes. They need to buy into the fact that we have to buy things differently and pay for them differently. So, so that's, where, that's where they fit in, and it's, so far it's working, but but we'll see. Now, what I want to go back to the technology piece again. We, we've sort of had a rare opportunity here in that we've taken advantage of it. And this is going to impact you all tremendously. And, and, and that is if you know, I came in to, to this obviously through medicine. And what does everybody say about medical care? It's fragmented. You go from this doctor to this doctor to this doctor to this doctor and nobody talks to each other. Right? They say that. And it's expensive and it's unreliable and, and all this. Now, I don't know, but has any, have any of you all social workers ever heard that mentioned about social services? There's an analogy here, I think, that we can learn from. So one of our bright people at DMAS came to me one day and says, Doc, we're building this health information exchange. It's Dave Mix, actually. I'll name his name because he deserves a lot of credit for this. He says, Doc, we're building this health information exchange where we can have the records go from place to place where they're needed. We could do that for the Commonwealth. We could do that for social services. And there is a way to do it. And I said, really? You know, tell me about this. And that essentially was the beginning of the conversation. But what we are putting in place now is, is a way to number one, for individuals to go online to deal with the Commonwealth. Go to one, they'll go to a portal, they'll come to the DSS portal, for instance, and they'll be authenticated, just like you do when you go to Amazon.com or AOL or whatever. And you know who's gonna do your authentication for you? The DMV. We're working, can you believe that health is working with the DMV, for goodness sake? But why the DMV? 
Uh, they know who 70% of the population is today. And they've seen the birth certificates and all of those things. So we know that if DMV can authenticate that Bill Hazel is who he says he is, pretty reliably then we can use that information to do some online activity. So we, we are paying through health system reform money to create this authentication system out there so that people can begin to work with us online. But even more, what we have is we have all these systems, and I've heard you all complain that they don't talk to each other. Does anybody here really like ADAPT? <laughs> Martin, I know there's a light in my eyes, but I don't see any hands are up. Can you put that on our list to get rid of it? <laughs> all right, there's ADAPT. How about CANS? Any of you all dealing with kids? The CANS, the assessment, um, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, OASIS, anybody like OASIS? Yeah, no, okay, none of them talk to each other, and I hear the cut back, we don't get any information, we have to put this information in four systems and we don't get any back. So what we are doing is in the process of setting up this eligibility system, we're buying something called an enterprise service bus. And what essentially will happen is all of these systems, data will be able to ride the bus. So instead of having a lot of one-off where this system has to talk to this or this or else you have to download the information and then put it in over here, the information will be, will be able to go across the system so that we can then actually have a record that is shareable and available when appropriate with the right security and safeguards for the person who needs it. So imagine now you're sitting down with someone who comes in and they're applying for benefits and they maybe they're, they're applying for SNAP benefits. Theoretically, when we get to the end of this road, we will be able then to say, well, you, know, you also are eligible for Medicaid. Have you signed up yet? We can do that right now. And you don't have to do any more paperwork. And that's where, sort of where we're trying to go with this. And, and it will take a while to get there, but that's the goal. And for those who you want to do, be techies, who's heard of service-oriented architecture? SOA, SOA. You know, you're going to have to stay up here longer because, uh, because uh, most of us don't know, but there is a book. You know the dummies books? There's one called SOA for Dummies, Service Oriented Architecture for Dummies. Uh, that's where I learned all I needed to know about it. Well, probably not what I needed, but all I think I needed. But look at this because it sort of explains what we're doing. But our, our goal is to be able to tie your systems and our legacy systems into this bus, exchange data, get it where it's needed, and, and so that you all can use it. Ideally, after that, we would then have a, a layer of case management on top of it, and then an informatics layer so that we could actually look at the data and figure out who our high-risk clients are, customers are, and maybe focus our resources on them. Uh, some things don't need that level of attention, but that's sort of the vision going forward. About the, uh, about the IT. So to get you a little more detail about that, we'll bring the commissioner himself up to talk to you a bit about the customer portal, and then we'll be back to answer questions afterwards. Thank you.